We are live in five, four, three, two, one. Good afternoon, everyone. We welcome you all to Ortho TV online in association with Avana Medical Arthrex. Uh, this webinar is uh, on meniscus repair. And let me introduce today's uh, chairperson and the scientific chair. The Dr. Billy Paul Wilson is a senior consultant orthopedic surgeon with MIOT Chennai. Uh, his Area of clinical expertise is mainly sports injuries, knee surgeries, and shoulder surgeries. He has completed his undergrad from Trivandrum Medical College and postgrad from Manipal uh, Academy of Higher Education, Manipal. He has been an active member of ISACOS and ESCA, and he's one of the eminent faculty and speaker uh, across national and international conferences. And I would I take great pleasure in uh, introducing my very good friend, Dr. Nagra Shetty. He's from Mumbai where I practice. I have, I have had a chance to work with him many times at uh, Leelawati Hospital, Nanavati Hospital, Hinduja Healthcare. He completed his uh, undergrad from JNMC Vardha and post-graduation from Billari. He has experienced more than 15 years and I can vouch for him that I have seen him surg doing surgeries even for my patients and he does a lot of good arthroscopy surgeries. And uh, he is also a PG teacher in Diploma in Orthopedics in CPS and Fellowship Director of Arthro Sports. He is a well-known speaker and eminent faculty at various national and international conferences and has been the organizing secretary and faculty for arthroscopy courses of Bombay Orthopedic Society. With further ado, I hand over the meeting to Dr. Billy Wall, Paul Wilson to take over the proceedings. Thank you very much. Thank you, Neeraj. And uh, welcome you all to this um, case-based discussion on complex uh, municipal tasks. Uh, we have a rich faculty today with uh, experience in arthroscopic surgery and uh, especially in uh, knee surgery. And they're all passionate about meniscal repairs. And I'm sure we're going to learn a lot uh, from this um, webinar. I hand over to Dr. Nagra Chetty to introduce the faculty and then we'll take the course from here on. Thank you, uh, Dr. Billy, and uh, thank you to Athrik Savana for uh, arranging this wonderful uh, uh, meeting. Uh, the idea of the meeting was to keep it case-based, to keep it based on technical tips and tricks, and to give as many take-home messages to the viewers as possible, and we'll try to fulfill this uh, agenda. I've uh, got an excellent team of faculty uh, for this meeting. Me and Billy will try to make sure that we extract maximum amount of uh, take-home messages from their presentations. Uh, so I will be going in first, after which I will introduce the next speaker. And as the talks come up, we will go ahead with the uh, introduction of each speaker. So the first topic that is to be spoken is by me on meniscal centralization, uh, a new arthroscopic solution for the problem which has troubled us for many years, that is meniscus extrusion. So I'll just share my screen now. So uh, meniscus centralization uh, it has been in work for the last about two to three years. And uh, we have started uh, introducing it in our practice around the same period of time it was first reported. And I'm happy to share that I've got a fairly good uh, follow-up of these cases, which I'll share as the presentation goes ahead. This is my profile in brief. The case history is that it was a 55-year-old homemaker who presented to us with progressive and increasing pain which uh, for the duration of about a month. She heard a pop from the knee while she was standing from the cross leg position. She was standing up and then the pain increased. So primarily it was incidence in onset, the, but the pain worsened after the pop. There was no past history of persistent pain. So she was not a patient with knee pain per se. And all the loading activities like prolonged standing, climbing stairs is increasing her pain. So to summarize, this is not a patient who is primarily having pain for a long duration of time. A subtle event like just standing up from cross leg position, she heard a pop, after which the pain has been worsening and inability to do even basic loading work. So the first thing that you want to see, obviously, as we know, but to reiterate is you need to check the alignment. You need to make sure that the knee is exposed. You need to make sure that the patient walks into your chamber uh, and you look at her alignment. So whether she is in varus, because if she is in varus, it's a different ball game altogether. And we're looking at a patient of malalignment as the primary cause for the knee pain. And that needs to be corrected. We'll keep that discussion out of this 
uh, as far as possible. Just to summarize, you need to look at the gate and the alignment thoroughly. So this is a case. It's a no-brainer, significant virus. This is a young lady. She's hardly 42, and she has a similar uh, tear of for which we did a complex osteotomy, a double osteotomy, and we have got an alignment back. But that's just about the to understand the importance of seeing the alignment. You need to quantify the alignment. It's not just important to see it, and not just important to get a simple weight-bearing AP X-ray, but you need to get a scanogram because then you know exactly how the mechanical axis is passing through. That's how typically the mechanical axis passes through, just medial to the medial border of the medial tibial spine. Some amount of mechanical axis deviation is acceptable. A mechanical tibial axis wherein there is about three to four degree virus is acceptable. Anything beyond five degree virus, we would suggest do a uh, osteotomy to correct the malalignment. So the importance of scanogram I've explained on this slide. Now the importance of understanding on the MRI. You, on the MRI, you need to look for these pathologies called as a root tear, which Dr. detail. But meniscus extrusion is the byproduct of a root tear. So on the actual image, you can see the root tear. You can classify the root tear as a radial tear or avulsion type tear. And most importantly, where, where I am primarily coming in today is about extrusion. So in the mid coronal image, when you draw this line, you can quantify the extrusion, whether it is few millimeters or more than four millimeters. And if it's beyond three to four millimeters of extrusion, the routine techniques of root repair are not sufficient. And that's the crux of this talk and how we can prevent the extrusion and whether these techniques work. So this is the patient. She had a complete radial tear at the posterior horn root junction. She had four to five millimeter of extrusion. And that is the limit for which I decide that I need to do something extra. And that is what the centralization procedure is all about. So this, just to summarize, this is how a meniscus root tear without extrusion looks like. So when you draw the line, most of the meniscus, more than two thirds of it is within the inner part of the line. This is a, uh, a tear with mild extrusion. And this is the one with moderate extrusion where it is in the range of almost three millimeters, almost four millimeters. And that's where the centralization procedure comes in. It was first described in 2017 by Japanese authors. And after which we started doing this in our patients too, uh, with almost the similar technique over the years. So this is a quick video of how we go about it. And I'll share the tips and tricks as the video progresses. So this is the right knee. The viewing is from the anterolateral portal. As you can see, there is minimal degeneration in the medial compartment. When we start the arthroscopy, we will see that the joint is not opening up well. So we always do the pie crusting. So I palpate the uh, anterior medial part and then use the 18 gauge small needle from the TUR set to get this nice pie crusted view. And then you can introduce your probe. You can see there's a complete tear. You can do some debridement. You need to now release some additions between the meniscus and the capsule on the undersurface and on the superior surface of the meniscus because you want to make sure that you create a low tension repair. I always create a trans petla tendon portal. I also try to create biology by burring on the medial tibial spine. I then use a curved shaver blade to go to that area. So the first part of the procedure is going to be on the root repair. I won't go into the details. Dr. Vikram is going to be covering all this. So the regular standard technique of passing the sutures first and then the tapes. The tapes are retrieved uh, to, to the tra uh, trans petla tendon portal and then use a passport cannula. Use the dedicated jigs which are available. Come to the anatomic center of the root. It's important not to cheat. If you find that the root is extruded, if you are unable to get the root to that area, you need to do the releases which I show, but you need to make the tunnel in the anatomic location always. Laprat has shown in the studies that a non-anatomical tunnel will not ensure you good results. Curved curette coming in. Curved shaver blade, suture shuttle, shuttling of the tapes into the tunnel. This is how you make sure there is no uh, entrapment in the fat pad. Now oh, coming, to the mid, coming to the mid uh, portal, that's the spinal needle. That's the hemostat coming in. So you, you create a mid femoral portal from where your spine needle comes in and then your knife comes in, hemostat comes in and then the liberator, use the bankart liberator and the bankart rasp to release the adhesions between the meniscus and the tibia. The meniscotibial ligaments have to be thoroughly released. 
when you're doing this your assistant is always constantly pulling on the tapes as you can see on the image and you need to have an assistant who supports the foot sits on a stool and maintains that 30 to 45 degree flexion i operate in the leg holder position and i find that extremely useful you then come with this all suture anchor guide you try to keep it posteriorly the stitches have to be passed to the menisco capsular junction anterior to the anchor so that's the all suture anchor being placed that's the suture lasso that i am coming up with that's the micro suture lasso which helps me to pass it at the menisco capsular junction just anterior to the anchor so that make sure that you centralize it and you transfer the forces towards the root the hd wire loop is being shuttled for the suture as your experience progresses you can start using two such anchors so this is the two anchor technique station the sutures in the passport cannula tie the posterior suture first so create a virtual cannula use your eye strong twice to pass it through that portal so that you create a virtual cannula tie the knot when you are tying the knot your assistant is pulling on the sutures of the root and that make sure that you create a low tension repair cut the sutures tie the second knot and you have this tightening of the tape of the root uh, uh, sutures over a over a over a suture disc and that's the final outcome so that's the root repair with centralization which is in a low tension manner and in an anatomical position when we started this we were we were concerned as to how the outcomes are going to be so we have followed up our patients so that's the final repair and the centralized meniscus so this is the two month follow up we make sure that they wear an offloading brace for a prolonged duration of time of about 6 6 months to a year this is the pre op actual image of one of the patients and that's the post op image showing the healing of this root tissue that's the coronal image showing the pre op extrusion of the body segment and the post op where there is no extrusion you can see the anchor tracks there and the centralized body segment that's the pre op 5 mm extrusion and the post op the meniscus is not extruded anymore and that's the pre op root tear and the post op image is showing the nice root tissue which is there in that area and there is minimal cartilage changes or this is a follow up of a patient almost 2 and 1/2 years old this is a very unique case he is a marathon runner who had a significantly extruded meniscus tear these are challenging cases and he is back to his full function in in summary you need to check for the alignment confirm with the scanogram look at the appropriate mri images to identify the tear type do not create a high tension repair do not create a non anatomical tunnel if the extrusion is more than 4 mm you need to consider the centralization procedure thank you thanks nairaj this is a uh, wonderful presentation there and uh, you have highlighted the importance of centralization uh, does any of the other faculty have any questions to ask so yeah go on vikram uh, dr nagraj wonderful presentation uh, thank you my question to you to you is that do you routinely centralize or do you you centralize in certain situations only uh my threshold for centralization has gone lower as my experience has increased uh, present cut off is about 3 mm if there is a more than 3 mm extrusion i go for the centralization procedure and uh, for every root tear i am ready with my centralization equipment uh nagraj just another uh, question i wanted to ask was um Uh, in uh, laprade's biomechanical study when they did the centralization following anatomical root repair um they did notice that yes your extrusion was corrected but when they loaded it at uh, 90 degrees or so there was some extrusion so all our mris are actually done with um, uh, the patient lying down it's not a, on a loaded knee do you have any studies that uh, you come across that they've done mri standing mris if possible but they got any great question. great question billy and in fact this was one of the points i was discussing in the previous meetings you are absolutely right extrusion is a dynamic phenomenon and we very well know that an extruded meniscus comes into the knee extrudes out of the knee so it's a dynamic structure so static image cannot really uh, tell us about a dynamic structure we are in discussion with the radiologists for doing ultrasound studies to see if this uh, extrusion dynamically can be assessed there is one paper where they have done standing mris 
I have evaluated this in our centers, which are high volume musculoskeletal MRI centers, but no, they are nowhere near even understanding how to do no. a dynamic MRI. So this is the best we have as of now. The follow-ups done at about two years, where we take the static images. Uh, obviously, the scoring systems have been uh, guiding us whether these patients do well. But uh, what we are we are very happy with what we are seeing as of now because there are no bridges burned. Mm -hmm. Initially, it seems to be very intimidating when you're releasing this tissue, when you're using the punches to release this tissue, etc. But I think the scar tissue that forms over a period of time ensures that the centralization is maintained. Okay. Good. I think if there are any questions, we'll uh, leave it till the end and then uh, we'll move on with the next topic. Great. So uh, our next speaker is Dr. Vikram uh, Maiskar, and uh, he's a consultant knee and shoulder surgeon at Max Super Speciality Hospital in uh, Delhi. He has completed his MS Orthopedics from Bangalore, his MCH Orthopedics. He is a fellowship trained surgeon from Australia. Uh, he is a co-author of uh, uh, Maheshwari and Maheshwari's Ma Essential Orthopedics book. He is an award uh, winning surgeon and he has been involved in research activities in, in fast bowlers. He is academically very active and has over 15 international publications and five textbook chap chapters. So great uh, uh, to have Vikram here and Vikram will be uh, talking to us about BD meniscus root tears, uh, which is a silent epidemic. Over to you, uh, Vikram. Thank you so much, Dr. Nagraj. Uh, it's, uh, thank you, Dr. Billy, for this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Nagraj and team Arthrex and my esteemed faculty. Uh, it's always a pleasure to talk about a topic which you know typically says a stitch in time saves nine. So if we can identify this, this particular problem on time, then we could save the patient a lot of woos later on in, in life. So I start off. So I start with my first case. It's a 49-year-old housewife with a BMI of 29. She has pain for the last two weeks since using an Indian-style toilet when she got up and she squatted. And she's unable to flex her knee beyond 90 degrees. And weight bearing was extremely painful and she presented to me within two weeks of her problems. And uh, seeing her coronal images, you have a reasonable degree of extrusion. Her uh, axials uh, show a truncation sign and these were her sagittals that were quite evident that she had a medial meniscus root tear. And as a part of my uh, protocol, taking a cue out of our present discussion, I do my ultrasounds myself in all my patients standing and sitting. So that gives me a dynamic picture of the degree of extrusion that the patient has. And here you can see that she had an extrusion of approximately four millimeters in this case, which was quite severe. Her scanogram showed a reasonable alignment, at least visible literature. It was about three degrees mechanical varus. So how did I decide to manage her? So there were various options. It was a meniscus root repair, root repair plus HTO, HTO alone or conservative. Uh, I had a multiple thoughts in my mind, but it's sometimes very hard to convince a patient when they're on the borderline to undergo a bony alignment procedure along with an arthroscopic repair. So uh, speaking to her, counseling her, we decided to go ahead on doing a root repair. And this is my classical technique of how I do it. Uh, this is a small animation. So this is the a root tear. I tend to decorticate the footprint first till I have nice bleeding bone. Uh, I then introduce a passport cannula over which, uh, I mean, I then introduce my ACL jig. I use a standard ACL jig, drill a guide wire at the center of my footprint and over drill it with a 4 mm drill bit. Once done, I take my bites through my knee scorpion, first a little medial to my root and then a slightly closer to the root and shuttle my suture tapes. I deliver a ethibond loop through the orifice and then through the passport cannula and uh, shuttle my suture tapes, the four ends, through my anteromedial uh, aperture on the tibia. Following which, once this is done, I get my adequate tension and then arthroscopic guided, I tie, tie it over a button. So this is what it is. Let's go into the knee. So she had a classical type two laprad, not terrible osteoarthritis on the medial side. I introduce my uh, curette, you know, Identify the footprint spare time here. Do your MCL pie crusting, definitely. Introduce your jig. You get some low profile jigs these days that can be easily introduced without causing cartilage damage. Uh, though I still prefer my standard ACL jigs. You take a bite, a little medial uh, to the meniscus through your knee scorpion. 
This is my attempt to reduce extrusion however I can. I like tapes. I don't use sutures. I use only tapes. There goes my second bite closer to the, uh, to the root and my second tape gets shuttled. Here you can see now that my ethibond loop has been delivered. I like a single tunnel technique. I don't tend to do two tunnels more often than not. So here you have my loop and uh, the loop shuttles the four ends of the suture uh, tapes antromedially. And uh, looking at it, uh, you know, arthroscopically, while I'm viewing this area arthroscopically, I make sure my tension is right and I tie it over an ABS button. And you can see that the meniscus is quite nicely reduced and quite stable at the end of the procedure. So lo behold, expect the unexpected. Three months post-surgery. So I, I keep them non-weight bearing for six weeks on a, a long knee brace. And then I'm very circumspect about, I'm, I'm very slow with my root repairs, with weight bearing. Uh, I don't let them go back to running or any impact activities till about four to six months at least. But three months later, she comes back with sudden pain while coming downstairs when she slipped a little bit with an inability to bear weight. And there I did my MRI and you see the classical bony edema on the medial femoral condyle. What do I do? So, so I, do I wait and watch? Do I do a high tibial osteotomy at this stage? UKR, TKR, so I'm a knee surgeon, I do all this. So anything else? So I decided to wait and watch first. So the first aim was to reduce the bony edema there. After waiting and watching serial MRIs every month, three months later, the bony edema settled. There was no bony edema. And I decided to go in arthroscopically. And here you can see there's some fibrosis happening with the capsule, but the root is not back to its original location the way it should have been. And her osteoarthritis has progressed on the medial femoral condyle. The tibia seems rather nascent here. Lateral side was perfect. So now what? So do I do a revision route? Do I do a UKR because she was 49 bordering, you know, one stop shop, be done with it, feel happy. You know, it's a big deal going through these alignment procedures and stuff. Or do I do a HTO or HTO plus root repair? So very important to talk to your patients when you do a root repair, keep talking to them. These are patients you need to actually cultivate. So what did I decide? I said, all right, let me do a HTO or a HTO plus root repair, depending on my arthroscopy. I decided to go ahead with a HTO and a root repair. I did a HTO, I corrected her alignment to about two degrees mechanical valgus on the lateral side. And this is the take home message. So when you have no alignment issues, all right, though this was a borderline case, Doing a root repair all alone, bringing back, doing Dr. Nagaraj's centralization helps. But if you have a virus knee, whether three, whether five, virus means it can fail. So be prepared. Do a HTO along with it. And doing a root repair or not along with it is your prerogative. I decided to do it here, but you may or may not. And she did well. I've got a two-year follow-up on her. We move on to case number two. So this is a, I'm sorry. Okay, this is a, can you see my slides, please? Yeah, we can. Yes, yes. Yeah. A 34-year-old iron man, pain on the inner side of the knee with inability to run fast and felt uh, painlessly be and was very painful, flexing it beyond 90 degrees. There was, it was sudden in onset while fixing his bike in a squatting position during a triathlon with a BMI of 22. Super fit guy. These were his uh, sagittal images. You can see that he's got a horizontal possible degenerative component and a truncation of the meniscus possible root tear. This is what I expected. Alignment, beautiful. He had the perfect legs that you would ask for. And this was the arthroscopy when I did it. So here you can see that the patient has a root tear, an unusual type of root tear that really doesn't fall into any of the categories, but he had a bucket handle component associated with it. So there's a bucket handle and a root component uh, associated with this. And when I further probed, there was a horizontal component beyond that. So uh, now what do we do? ACL was perfect. The other two compartments were absolutely pristine. Couldn't have asked better. So what would I do? So I sh should I do a partial medial meniscectomy? These were the thoughts in my mind. HTO, HTO with meniscectomy, arthroscopic meniscus root repair alone or anything else. So I thought maybe let's catch the, uh, you know, the bait as we find it. I went in arthroscopically, so I decided to basically debride the bucket handle component because that was in the white white zone. Healing would have been questionable. So I debrided the bu bucket handle component uh, of this meniscus till my, root, till my horizontal and root component were, were nicely visible. I decided to tackle these two independently. 
So I did, uh, I mean, my, my regular technique of, of rasping it after doing a meniscus uh, pie crusting, sorry, M MCL pie crusting, took my bites through the horizontal component using the, uh, the knee, knee scorpion with standard uh, uh, 2O fiber wires to tackle the uh, horizontal component and uh, put in my standard uh, SMC knots in place and then tackle the uh, root component independently with the standard technique that I usually do. And uh, you had my tapes going through, so I had to make sure there's adequate space to shuttle my tapes, which would also form a way of closing the fish's mouth, as we call it in a horizontal tear. So you have my two tapes here. You have to be precarious in these because they have a degenerative component attached to them. So the meniscus quality may be questionable. Mm -hmm. So taking bites is a great thing. So once you have it in here, I, uh, you can see a reduced uh, meniscus root and a tackled horizontal component. This was his uh, M MRI. You can see uh, that the, uh, there's some element of healing in the meniscus. Uh, the root is reduced. My ultrasound shows no extrusion at six weeks. So I tend to do it at six weeks and on table because your anesthetist always has a wonderful ultrasound machine. And at two years follow up, you can see that the horizontal component to a great extent has healed up and there is no extrusion of the meniscus and you can't see the root component here. And here he is back in action uh, in the gym and uh, he's pretty happy, uh, you know, uh, running his uh, Ironman and ultra triathlons and marathons back again with uh, no complaints whatsoever at the end of uh, three years follow up. So thank you very much. Thank you Vikram, wonderful uh, presentation. A uh, quick question to you with regards to your root repair technique because uh, that's your primary uh, 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 talk based on. So which is among the two sutures for the benefit of the audience, uh, which is the suture that you tie first or you follow any sequence and the reason for it? Right. So I tie my, my, my basically my two sutures are for security. So my first medial suture, the one which is very medial to the root is my attempt to reduce the extrusion. The one closer to the root basically makes the, the root sit on the footprint and facilitate healing. So I tend to tie all four ends. So I identify two ends, two ends and tie them together rather than tying them individually. So I tie them together through the, through, through the ABS button and then try individual knots of the individual sutures for security, that's all. So I treat them as one suture with an attempt to reduce extrusion as well as stabilize the root. Great. Another point to take home here is that uh, the tissue quality is very poor near the root. And that's why Vikram was mentioning that we need to go as medial as possible. Taking the same principle, I tie the most medial one first. I tie that first because then there has been an occasion when we are tying the uh, midline one or the lateral one, it has cut through. So I tie that first, make sure the tension is low on it. One more tip is over the years, what I've done is now that we flex the knee a bit and just check how much ROM can be allowed in the post-operative period. And uh, typically you try to tighten any of your meniscus sutures, ideally in near extension to restore the hoop stresses. But these are the take home messages. The tissue quality is poor. So you need to be careful that there is no cut through. So Billy, I think we'll go ahead with the next uh, yeah, we will. presentation. Yeah, the other questions we'll ask at the end. Yeah. At the end, we'll come back to it. So our next speaker is Dr. Ashok Selvaraj. And he's a consultant arthroscopy and sports medicine surgeon at MIOT Chennai. He has more than 16 years of orthopedic experience. He has completed his MS orthopedics from uh, Stanley Medical College. Uh, he specializes in arthroscopy, sports medicine, limb alignment, surgeries, and joint replacements. And he has got awarded for best research uh, in various national forums. So over to you, Dr. Ashok uh, Selvaraj. Ashok, you're muted. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, uh, good afternoon to all. Uh, I, uh, I thank Dr. Billy Paul Wilson and Dr. Nagaraj Shetty for giving me this opportunity to present today. And also I thank uh, Arthrak Savana for this opportunity. So my topic is basically on a radial tear of the meniscus, uh, solving the dilemma. Uh, the thing is, uh, 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 thing is basically, or uh, traditionally, all uh, radial tears of uh, meniscus has been treated with meniscus technique. Uh, until recently, we have started doing meniscus repairs, which has become a real work. But radial tears are still taboo for most of the people. But 
the, of all the meniscal te uh, tests, the one which needs repair is the radial test. Why? Because in this, in, in a radial, complete radial tear, it transects the circumferential cholangeal fibers completely. So it distorts the load dispersion and also alters the tibiofemoral contact pressure. The, it is the highest among all the uh, tear patterns in the meniscus. So when this happens, there is a loss of ability to absorb the hoop stress. It's akin to a patient having a total meniscectomy. So which in turn leads to patient having rapid cartilage degeneration. Another point to note is radial tears are quite common in the lateral compartment. So, and we all know that lateral compartment, when the, there's a meniscal loss, they go in for rapid uh, cartilage degeneration and arthritis. So this becomes imperative for us to repair. So uh, a study done by Zhang, it also was published in 2015, analyzed the contact pressures uh, in patients uh, with radial tears after meniscectomies and also uh, following uh, uh, meniscal repairs and found that the repairs definitely improves the uh, contact pressures. So uh, there are many studies which have uh, assessed the outcomes of following a meniscal repair. Mainly they are longitudinal or bacchantal tears and have found very good results. There are only few articles which had uh, pro, uh, shown the outcome following a uh, repair. The important thing to note is to know whether the meniscus has healed or not. The only way or the best gold standard is second look arthroscopy. MRI to an extent helps. And uh, a recent systematic review published in arthroscopy uh, analyzed all these uh, studies. And most of the studies in that uh, systematic review, the patients had had second look arthroscopy and they found that complete healing was present in about 60 to 86% of the patients and only about 10% of the patients uh, had failure. So this results. Uh, uh, is really eye-opening eye in the sense that you do a proper radial repair, uh, radial tear repair, you can get results as good as you get for a longitudinal test. So this should uh, encourage us to do repair of the radial tears when we have uh, seen them. So what are the basic types of radial tears? Uh, there are three types. Basically, one, there is a simple radial tear when, when it starts from the periphery to the, comes to the center. And there is a complex radial tear where there's a longitudinal component as well along with the radial tear. And the third one, which is uh, in the lateral meniscus, is when the longitudinal component extends to the uh, popliteal hiatus. This is significant because when it extends to the popliteal hiatus, it makes the meniscus more stable, uh, more unstable, sorry, and needs a more robust repair. So, what are the basic principles of uh, repair? It's like any other uh, meniscal repair. We have to freshen the meniscal edges, uh, we have to freshen the synovial tissue, we have to get good approximation of the meniscal tear, and we have to get a tension-free stable repair. And also, if the patient doesn't have an associated ACL re uh, reconstruction, which adds biology, you have to think of other biological techniques like a fibrin clot or, or a PRP or BMAC to enhance the healing of the meniscus. So I'll move on to the first case. He was an 18-year-old uh, person who had a road traffic accident present with the anterior cruciate uh, ligament tear along with the lateral meniscal tear. As you can see in the MRI, he had a, a complete radial tear anterior to the popliteal hiatus, but we can see that he also had a longitudinal component, uh, uh, longitudinal tear as well, which was extending beyond the popliteal hiatus into the posterior horn. So this was a complex tear with involvement of the popliteal hiatus. So moving on to the operative video. So here we are doing the diagnostic arthroscopy. We can see that there is a complete radial tear. It's a fresh tear. So it's still bleeding. So it's an ideal case for us to repair. So we assess the reducibility of the meniscus first. Then we check for the posterior horn. So when you probe it, we can see that it's unstable. So in these cases, first we have to stabilize the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus. So in, uh, in this case, we st uh, stabilize the posterior horn. Uh, and the posterior aspect of the uh, lateral meniscus using an all inside technique, uh, a horizontal mattress suture is, uh, will suffice. Once to stabilize that, then there is a little risk that the meniscus will uh, sublux into the joint while you are attempting a repair for the radial tap. So once we have finished that, then we go on to repair the lateral meniscus anterior to the popliteus using inside out technique. Since the a lateral meniscus anterior to the popliteal hiatus is unstable. 
we have put a vertical matter stitch which acts as a rip stop mechanism so it's a vertical matter which stabilizes the meniscus as well as it acts as a rip stop mechanism uh and then we use the next suture which is passed just posterior to the vertical matter suture so it has uh, uh used two uh, advantages that it prevents the meniscus from uh, subluxing to the joint and also prevents the cut through of the uh, sutures we didn't apply the rip stop suture in the anti aspect of the tear as the uh, tear was stable so once you have passed the sutures we check the reduction of the meniscus we are happy with the reduction and we can we should be very important that the repair should be tension free and also we are also similarly pass sutures and under surface of meniscus similar to the stripper once we are assessed and we put under surface we put a, a another suture at the red red zone using an outside in technique and we make sure that the suture coming in the anti aspect is beyond the uh, uh, first suture so that the sutures are in the criss cross pattern in the anti aspect of the red suture so that this criss cross pattern prevents the cut through of the sutures you can see that the sutures in the anterior aspect or in the criss cross pattern so that they prevent uh, cut through and also we can see there is a good reduction of the meniscus so this patient at 3 years of uh, follow up well, had gone back to all his normal activities and sports activities was able to squat uh, sit cross it all his uh, scores were uh, normal so this case too is a 25 year old male who also had an acl tear and present with a lateral uh, 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 meniscus radial tear, but it was the radial tear was in the posterior horn uh, of the lateral meniscus. So here you can see that there is a tear in the lateral meniscus with some uh, irregularity. So we have to assess the reducibility, and you can also see that in the under surface there is another longitudinal component as well. So when you are repairing this meniscus, we should make sure that we repair that. longitudinal component of the uh, tear which is present the under surface so you check for the re reducibility since this tear is in the posterior horn and it's not extending uh, till the popliteal hiatus we uh, decided to redu uh, repair it by all inside technique as important to first take the stitch in the uh, posterior horn aspect uh, once you are comfortable with the suture then we take uh, uh, in the uh, 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 lateral meniscus So, on, so while reducing, we should be make sure that uh, it doesn't cut through uh, with the sustained slow pressure, and we reduce the meniscus. Once we are com uh, comfortable with the reduction, uh, and we are happy with it, uh, this place in the surface, and uh, make sure that longitudinal aspect of the meniscus there. Also included in to stabilize it. So once you are happy with it, uh, we slowly tension it. Then stable reduction. Then we can follow it up with an ACL reconstruction. So this patient at four years, he was uh, able to do uh, uh, sit cross leg and squatting, and he has gone back to all his normal day to day activities. The third case is a, a, a patient with a ACL tear present a month later from the injury. He had a simple uh, radial tear anterior to the popliteal hiatus, and there was no uh, uh, a longitudinal tear beyond that. So, so repair for them is fairly straightforward. We do an uh, inside-out technique. We put a, a horizontal stitches from the uh, posterior part of the la la torn lateral meniscus to the anterior part. Uh, so two sutures are placed on the upper upper surface of the meniscus and one suture is placed underneath the meniscus uh, similar to the first stitch so you can see here uh, suture is placed in the under surface of the meniscus this is very important to prevent the uh, uh, abnormal motion in the meniscus and the second suture is placed at the uh, uh, meniscus capsular junction and similar to the first case we try to make it a criss cross pattern in the uh once you tend that we get good at a reduction uh as is reduction we tie them over a small uh, incision outside
So this patient uh, came to us two years later with some uh, incidental injury to the knee, which gave us an opportunity to uh, examine, uh, do an MRI for them. We were, we were able to note that uh, there is contact between the meniscus tear and also Are you able to see my screen? Yes, Dr. Ashok. Uh, okay. Sorry, I am not able to see that. Sorry. sorry. One second. Sorry. Are you able to see now? No, we can see your screen, but I think uh, uh, your presentation is mostly done. So. Uh, the shall we go ahead with the questions to you, or is there something? A uh, uh, couple of you? more slides. Uh, can I finish up with a couple of more slides? If sure, okay. sure. If you can upload, okay. yeah. Uh, you are not able to see my screen, right? No, we can see your image, not the presentation. Okay, sorry. Is it seen visible now? Yes, now we can see. You can put oh, it sorry. on the slide show. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, so all patients, uh, sorry for the inconvenience. Uh, all patients are put on non-weight bearing crutch walking for six weeks and they are not allowed to bend the knee beyond 90 degrees uh, for six weeks. Beyond six weeks, they are put on a standard ACL protocol. If the patients have uh, not had any ACL uh, reconstruction along with that, we do some biological procedure like fibrin clot or any PRP injection for the patients. So take home message is uh, all radial tasks uh, without repair have poor prognosis. Uh, successful repairs uh, with good outcome can be achieved, which has been shown by multiple studies. So technique of repair doesn't matter as long as you uh, get a stable repair with uh, uh, adequate biological conditions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ashok. Uh, wonderful presentation. A question to you with regards to your repair technique which you showed for the radial tear near the root and the posterior horn. So could you share the tips for the audience as to how you make sure the vessels are protected? Because as you know, the vessels are very close to the posterior horn root junction. Yeah, uh, it is very important that we may, uh, usually in any lateral meniscal tear, we come from the opposite portal from that to repair. So, but in the case of a radial tear, the, uh, the, uh, uh, we have to come from the anterolateral portal. We have to be in directly in line with the vessels. So it's very important to have a measurement. Yeah, I didn't show those things in the report, but we have to measure with a probe the size of the meniscus and the capsule beyond that. And also in the MRI, you have to assess where the vessel is, get an appropriate idea if there is any abnormality in that. And according to that, you uh, keep the size of the uh, uh, all inside, all uh, all inside needle shorter. So usually we use 18 mm. In these cases, I use either 16 or 14 mm. And you should also visualize the capsule where your needle is. So beyond that, so uh, because of time, I couldn't show that. We, we always visualize that and uh, make sure that we are not gone too much between. Make keep it at 14 and 16 and uh, 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 pass the needle. So with these uh, measures. We, can, we are pretty sure we will not uh, damage the vessel. Sure. So thank you for your tips. The only thing which I could add and uh, is that you are absolutely right. You come from a, a diagonally opposite portal. You make sure that the knee is in slightly flexion. The more you are closer to flexion of 90 degrees, the more the vessels are pushed behind. Yes. And remaining tips you are very well discussed. Yes. Uh, Billy, is there something you want to add or? So basically we do all the meniscal repairs in a figure of four position. So Correct. we uh, have a more flexion so like you said the vessels are pushed back and we have more space for us to work in correct billy i think you're muted um, I'll, what i'll do is i'll ask these questions at the end so i got a couple of questions for each uh, faculty perfect perfect. At the end. perfect so i'll go ahead with my uh, topic that is on uh, ramp repair and what are the state-of-the-art solutions for ramp uh, lesion repair now this is a topic which all of us are aware and it has been discussed over the years on multiple forums so we'll keep the theory part of it to the minimum and discuss the tips and tricks and the technical uh, points that I'd like to share. So this was a 23 year old male who was, who was a film stuntman by profession and uh, he had an injury while doing one of his stunts. 
he complained of significant instability uh the lakman in these cases is usually very soft end point that they have and that's that should be one of the uh, uh, red flags so they have a subtle pivot and sometimes a high grade pivot and they have a soft end point and an excessive translation on their lakman maneuver so this is the clinical thing that you need to look for you obviously need to look if they have a high grade pivot so whenever you have a high grade pivot you need to look at the corners both the medial and the lateral corners that is the lateral meniscus root tear has to be ruled out now this is the classic ramp lesion that you will see on the mri on the actual image you will see the meniscal capsular separation a line which is dividing the meniscus from the capsule on the sagittal image again you will see this uh, longitudinal tear you will sometimes see posterior medial tibial contusion all these point out to a ramp lesion sometimes this will not be reported on your mri so classically this patient had a mid substance acl tear meniscus ramp lesions have been well described by the laprade group and has been classified uh, in this article well it was also brought to notice by uh, sonri cote from lyon france wherein in his series they saw they found almost a 40% incidence of ramp lesion so about 100 cases of acl they saw the ramp lesion in about 40% of them of these 40% they said that 16% were missed by the traditional techniques so they decided that every acl surgery they're going to enter the posterior medial corner they're going to put a, a posterior medial portal and visualize it by probing this is the recommendation by the sonri cote group what is the ramp lesion we are all aware it's a meniscal capsular separation why a ramp because the meniscal capsular tissue in that area is like a ramp and a lesion in that area is called as a ramp lesion this classification is worth mentioning once again before we go for the technical tips so primarily what happens in a ramp lesion is that the meniscal tibial ligaments are cut sometimes there is a through and through tear but what's very important is that the meniscal tibial ligaments are usually affected the type 1 tear is a partial inferior lesion which is uh, usually stable the type 2 is when there is a partial superior lesion uh, this is usually diagnosed on the trans notch view which i will demonstrate how do you do that what are the tips for it the type 3 is again a partial uh, inferior lesion which is uh, uh, showing significant mobility so when you probe it there will be significant mobility the type 4 is when there is a through and through dis disruption that's the classic ramp lesion and that is the one that gives that signal and type 5 is almost like a bucket handle so there is an additional longitudinal component that is going in addition to the ramp lesion so this is the classification and the tips and tricks i'll share is for each type so this is the typical trans notch view you go between the pcl and the medial femoral condyle into the posterior medial corner uh, you need to ask your assistant to hold the limb in about 20 30 degree flexion and internal rotate the tibia which subluxates the tibia and helps you enter into this uh, area then drop the knee into 90 degree flexion because then that opens up the posterior medial pouch get a spinal needle and use it to hook the ramp area so that's the ramp shape of it and this is a normal trans notch view of the ramp this is a typical anterior arthroscopy video and this would be labeled as normal unless you go into the posterior medial corner through the trans notch view and the tips which we just discussed and then you will see this through and through radial tear uh, through and through ramp lesion where the superior and the inferior surface is involved this would have otherwise otherwise been missed i do the pie crusting extensively in these cases too to make sure that i have a nice working space for all the techniques that we are going to discuss so i do it on the tibial side with the 18 gauge needle and that opens up the space very well and something that is not visible suddenly is easy to visualize all the way up to the back if it is difficult for you with this technique you can shift your uh, scope to the anteromedial portal come with a wisinger rod from the anterolateral portal and railroad your sheet over this rod and you can enter the posterior medial corner so these are my tips to enter the posterior medial corner 20 to 30 degree flexion slight internal rotation or you shift to the anteromedial portal and use a switching stick now this is the classic through and through ramp lesion so you can see that the posterior medial tibial plateau has been exposed and that is why you need to make sure that you repair the meniscus tibial components with this what not to do traditionally and in your initial years you will find it difficult to do all the techniques so you might land up using the all inside devices so the first mistake is that you are doing an inadequate repair through a horizontal technique you are not entering the posterior medial corner so you don't know whether you have restored the height of the meniscus so it's a 
through and through tear so the meniscus has dropped down it has also been called as a bankart lesion of the knee so it has to be elevated like just how we do a bankart repair you need to also restore the menisco tibial component but it has to be in multiple stitches pattern you cannot cut short the technique by bypassing a larger area so you need to keep your stitches 3 to 4 mm apart and therefore this is not what you need to do it will just give you the satisfaction that you have repaired but it is not a stable repair so what we do is a two portal technique we create two posterior middle portals it has been well documented to be quite safe if you follow the tips and tricks which i just i'm going to discuss so if you are too high you uh, land up risking the gastroc and if you are too low you land up risking the saphenous nerve so you need to be in a particular triangle so you don't need to be too high or too low so the particular triangle is in the posterior middle corner the borders are the middle femoral condyle in front the gastroc fold behind the semi membranous fold below and the adductor fold above and this is how you will create a posterior middle portal so get your scope into the posterior middle corner in 90 degree flexion turn off the lights of the or the trans illumination gives you an idea and come in the exact center of the trans illumination so this is a broad area if you create a single portal it's going to be in the center if you are going to create two portals i'll show you how we go about it so this is my ramp repair technique the first spinal needle comes on a very high posterior middle level the second is at the level of the joint the first uh, uh, incision is on the lower part then incision is on the upper part here we try to create it parallel to the capsular fold so that there is no fluid extravasation and there is no risk of a synovial fistula because that automatically closes you then put a small low profile cannula like a crystal cannula in the upper portal and a switching rod in the lower portal you need to make sure there is good biology so you come with your rasp rasp both the surfaces the capsular surface and the meniscal surface thoroughly spend some time here also rasp the capsule that is very important because the macrophages and the healing potential is going to come from there use your shaver in the reverse mode with your suction off and debride this thoroughly so rasping of the edges shaving and uh, uh, coming with the lasso like device next this is a ramp lasso which is a 25 degree curve which is ideal for this bite which is on the medial side first the first bite is on the most medial side you take the capsular bite first and repair it like a bankart lesion now you take the meniscal bite and the 25 degree curve is perfect for this particular bite it is loaded with a, it is preloaded with a fiber stick so when it touches the saline it becomes like a suture and you are you are immediately able to tie a knot based on the meniscal quality usually the meniscal quality will be poor try to do a multiple half inches technique so that you don't cut through any of the sutures so you start from medial and then you can start coming to the central portion of the tear so you if you do not have a ramp plus so you can use a regular spectrum device which has got a 45 degree curve slightly difficult to negotiate so i'll share a tip with it with you so you pass the bite through the capsular surface first you then come through the hook probe from the medial portal and use it as a counter force to pierce the meniscal surface so this is the maneuver which is usually difficult and this counter force with the hook probe will help you you shuttle the ethylon for a fiber wire 2o suture and you can finish the knot so this is restored the meniscus to the height of the capsule but we have still not addressed the menisco tibial surface you can always use all inside devices near the root so that's my tips for the uh, inside out technique i won't go into the details because dr sagar is going to cover it but this is an example it's a left knee the viewing is from the anteromedial portal you will find it difficult to uh, negotiate the lateral tibial spine so bore it out come with your zone specific instruments which dr sagar will discuss and you can actually do an inside out repair not just on the under surface but also on the superior surface so now with confidence we can actually do a ramp lesion type of repair even with the inside out technique i won't go into much of details but what i'm trying to show here is for the under surface it's good to use the inside out technique and space it about 3 to 4 mm apart so that's the uh, inside out technique pass the bite through the meniscal surface first lift the meniscus up pass it through the capsular surface next sometimes it is difficult to lift it up you can come from a uh, opposite uh, a satellite portal lift the meniscus up with your hook probe and feed your cannula into the capsular surface and you will see that the meniscal flange is beautifully restored when you tighten that suture so that's the take home message that you need to uh, be aware of the inside out technique too for the meniscal under surface and as your confidence improves you can use it even for the superior surface of the meniscus
you can use all inside devices near the root because the meniscus is now restored and now, now there is no harm in using the uh, all inside devices because it is sometimes risky to go near the midline and use your all in, uh, inside out stitches because your needles can go into the midline into the dangerous structure so that's the completed ramp repair so this is the uh, lackman of one of the recent patients you can see the small posterior medial portals and this is the stunt man who is back to his injury prevention program and will and back to his early function so my take home messages are be aware of the partial superior and the inferior surface tears uh, practice the trans notch view to enter into the posterior medial pouch in every case and probe it with the spinal needle be proficient with the lasso devices the inside out devices and the all inside devices and remember do not forget the meniscus tibial ligament thank you thanks nagraj that was a very good talk i got one question for you so yes. for the ramp lesion is your rehabilitation any different to your normal posterior horn repair in terms of knee bending uh, billy no weight bearing weight bearing as well as uh, knee bending yes so with respect to the knee bending there is no difference whatsoever in fact uh, with this sort of a stable repair i am quite happy to get them to 90 degree as early as 2 to 3 weeks but i make sure that they don't go beyond 90 degree for 4 weeks because as we know the posterior of the middle meniscus gets uh, pinched between the condyles non weight bearing for 6 weeks straight away i am extremely extremely conservative with my weight bearing protocols for these extensive meniscus repairs so although although theoretically uh, the longitudinal tears are safe when you have taken these vertical mattress stitches and you can start weight bearing but i am conservative i keep them non weight bearing for 6 weeks straight away okay. agar jada question is you don't get ramp lesion as an isolated meniscal injury it's extremely rare it's often with an acl injury have you had patients who you have done an acl reconstruction and later on come back with a symptom for which you evaluated and noticed a missed ramp lesion because once you have stabilized the knee you would assume that you will not get any symptoms correct you are absolutely right and i think you are pointing out to an important uh, area i have seen patients coming back with a failed acl with a bucket handle tear and in all probability they are the ramp lesions which were missed in the primary surgery which landed up with excessive anterior tibial translation failure of their acl and the ramp lesion extended to now become a bucket so this i have seen yes thank you thank you so nagraj you muted sorry billy so my next our next speaker is dr sagar kakatkar uh, sagar is a, a, a consultant orthopedic surgeon at sayadri hospital and vivan clinic in nashik he specializes in surgeries of the shoulder knee foot and ankle and elbow uh, he is uh, a fellowship trained under dr tapasvi he is uh, also trained under dr jonathan herald in sydney australia and he has also uh, visited uh, world class centers in the us uh, and worked with dr robert laprat peter millet and matt provencher uh, sagar over to you for, to let us know about inside out repairs yes thank you nagar sir thank you dr billy uh, at the outset i would like to thank arthrex avana for this opportunity it's been a wonderful meeting we had wonderful presentations from dr nagaraj dr ashok and dr vikram so i'll be talking about the controlled inside out uh, meniscus repair techniques as we all know it has been coined a gold standard the inside out technique and uh, the reason being uh, it has been very successful so i start with my case i had a 38 year old farmer from uh, periphery of nasik i had a twisting injury to the knee uh, right knee two years back had several other injuries to the knee had repeated falls uh, didn't show anybody started with pain which got aggravated sequentially and was having pain while squatting and after prolonged standing he also complained of occasional locking on clinical examination had a positive macmorris and medial joint and tendons <clears throat> his mri showed that he did have a grade 3 uh, horizontal component uh, uh, with some uh, query longitudinal component as well the root seemed okay it is very important to see uh, the coronal and the axial images we could see that although he had a horizontal and a longitudinal component he did have a small paramenisal cyst near the root junction which was 
suggestive of some pathology uh, being there. So what are the aims of the surgery? First is to save the meniscus, provide the patient a painless knee. It has to be a cost-effective method, safe, and should be reproducible. And the success of the surgery depends on how anatomically you reduce it, how good a circumferential, circumferential compression of the meniscus you get, and biological preparation of the meniscus repair and or augmentation. So the instrument required are not uh, very uh, difficult to get. We have a needle holder, the uh, handle for the arthrex zone specific uh, inserter, the cannulae, which come in three shapes, the left and right, and the uh, most curved ones for the anterior uh, meniscal repairs. I do use uh, arthrex needles with fiber wires, or uh, you do get mini fiber tapes, 0.9 millimeter uh, in the size. We have been using the conventional cannulae. So what problems did we have? The curvatures were there, but the curvatures were not matching the TBL condyles. So you either had to do a notch plastic kind of a thing, or uh, you used to get osteochondral lesions on the TBL side. You always require two assistants, one to pass the needle and one to retrieve while you are holding the scope, and it led to increased surgical time. So if we look at the uh, cannula here, for the zone specific, it has a curve not only in one direction, but it has a, a bi-directional curve, which helps you negotiate the TBL condylar surface. The handle is ergonomically nice. You have to press the lever and then push it forward. If your assistant who is trying to retrieve cannot see the needle, then you can always pull the needle back very easily. Also, it has got a uh, variability. You can deattach and reattach the uh, cannula in different modes or in different directions. So very easy, uh, saves a lot of time. So we need not go on switching the portals very often. So the advantage advantages of the zone navigator system is with the conventional cannula, you could cover uh, some part of the meniscus, but almost all of the meniscal tissue can be covered with the zone navigator system with good curvatures. So diagnostic arthroscopy, pedal femoral compartment, and looking for that ramp region, what Dr. Nagaraj was telling you about, always I do it. Then the most important thing, another hidden lesion is I check for the anterior horn lesions of these menisca. You could see some fraying of the anterior horn of the medial meniscus, but it was not very significant. The patient had uh, almost a grade one uh, to grade two osteochondral lesion on the medial femoral condyle, probably because of the chronicity of the tear. The lateral side uh, compartment was good. The good lateral meniscus, the femoral and TBL compartments were very good, pristine. The medial side had obviously had OCD. The medial compartment, as you can see and appreciate, was very tight. I also prefer to do pie crusting on the TBL side so that I get good opening, but I do not uh, wait till I get that dangerous click uh, for the opening on the medial side. The medial meniscus tear anatomy is the most important step, and I think everybody should play a uh, good attention towards it. Identifying the anatomy, you could see that was a longitudinal component and anterior flat tear of the posterior horn of the medial meniscus uh, in the white white zone. So I went ahead and debrided the white white zone uh, flat tear of the medial meniscus near the posterior horn. The root attachment was actually intact. I proceeded prece uh, with the meniscal preparation a shaver in forward or backward mode without any section, followed by a meniscal rasp. You can use a different meniscal rasps. I prefer to use a convex uh, horizontal meniscal rasp. It has uh, got a good curvature, I feel. The posterior medial approach, as we all know, starts from the adductor tubercle and goes towards the posterior medial tibia. It is very important, posterior medial tibia, it is very important that you check that you are coming right at the incision site from your probe. It is a very good guide for your incision. After taking the skin and subcut, you will encounter the sartorial fascia, which after being cut, you will see that the medial retinaculum is there. Now, aim to search for the triangle with semimembranosus lying down inferiorly. I can see a gastro medial head of gastro, which is slightly central in position. 
then using a corpse elevator retract and uh, elevate this medial gastro from the capsule and put a spoon a regular spoon at the back so that it separates the medial gastro from the capsule and you have assistant can retrieve the needles from this so this is the area we are targeting with this posterior medial approach try not to go far posterior than the adductor tubercle because you can damage the saphenous nerve and you don't want your patients to complain with neuromas or paresthesias later on the suture passage uh, is very easy with this system as you can see it has got a wonderful curvature so it goes nicely under the femoral curvature does not damage the uh, femoral or the tibial side you have got a maneuverability and mobility of the zone navigator because the handle is very good i just trying to show how easily you can move the uh, cannulae around with the meniscus it is very useful in bucket handle tears as well because with this cannula i can push the meniscus towards the capsule and then start pressing the lever on the handle so that you get a good meniscal bite and this time around i was uh, taking a horizontal mattress for this patient uh, i tend to use uh, a suture tape or mini suture tape 0.9 mm for these patient obviously because it has a good tissue hold and there are hardly any cutouts i have seen even with the poor quality meniscus you just require one assistant uh, who can retrieve the sutures from your surgical incision site whenever you are doing it so it's easier to do with one hand you can push the needles uh, later on the meniscus which usually lifts up after you have taken the femoral sided bite you can easily go under that and then pass your meniscus suture mini suture tape subsequent suture passage can be done i prefer to use a mid body suture first so that it stabilizes the meniscus in its position and then i prefer to go on the posterior and anterior aspects of the tear it is easier to get more number of sutures in because the suture or the needle size is very small and you can throw in uh, multiple uh, vertical and horizontal stitches uh, more vertical components obviously give you better stability and later on in this case i had used around 8 or 9 uh, inside out needles i prefer to tie them in full extension or almost 10 degrees of flexion uh, without any valgus micro fracturing uh, at the north side on the lateral femoral aspect or using the fibrin clot do help uh, for the meniscal healing i do not keep any drains for these patients i would like to have hematomas so what are the advantages the needle uh, needle size is smaller so less meniscal tissue damage compared to all inside devices you can put in more number of sutures so better meniscal stability and you don't have any intraarticular implants or plastic uh, implants or any intraarticular knots for these as i said we have to be careful that you are not damaging the saphenous on the medial side and uh, common period and now for the posterior lateral incision if you are taking for the lateral meniscus infections can be a, a irritating irritating factor if you are because you are doing an open incision to avoid capsular puckering as i said if you are tightening the sutures in flexion you can land up with a fixed a fixed flexion deformity in these patients so it's better to tie the sutures up in 10 degrees of flexion or complete extension vascular injuries if you are taken good incisions and good retraction are very rare thanks a lot thank you sagar a wonderful presentation i have a question to you with regards to your posterior medial safety incision you very nicely demonstrated it uh can you share the tips for the audience do you need to take uh, the incision all the way from the adductor tubercle or can you take a incision which uh, which is slightly smaller and your tips for the same uh yes thank you sir for the question sir this is just for the demonstration purpose i had taken the incision uh this bigger uh usually uh since your meniscal needles are going downwards it is around 2 mm or 2 cm uh, distal to the joint line is a must for me and you can slightly extend the incision 1 cm towards the femoral side if required but otherwise a very small incision if you are doing good probing beforehand before taking the incision it does help uh, to plan your incision properly 
Absolutely, Sagar. So that's a wonderful point that predominantly the needles are directed downwards. So two third of your incision is uh, placed downward and only one third is on top. And the second risk, as you said, is uh, for the neurovascular bundle. So you don't want your needles to yeah. uh, go into the center of the knee. So you drop your knee into slight flexion so that the needles do get deflected from the uh, center towards your yeah. incision. So thank you, Sagar. We uh, now request Dr. Rufus to uh, share his slide where I, where I discuss his uh, profile. So Dr. Rufus is a senior consultant orthopedic surgeon uh, and an uh, arthroscopist, a trauma and a sports medicine surgeon at Rela Institute and Medical Center, Chennai. He has more than 10 years of orthopedic experience. He is a DNB trained and fellowship trained at Ganga and Ortho One centers. He's also fellowship trained in hip arthroscopy and arthroplasty from Spain. He's also completed his fellowships from Perth, Australia. He has numerous research uh, papers uh, in uh, numerous international journals and has received best paper recognition at various national conferences. So over to you, Dr. Rufus, for your presentation on all inside uh, suture uh, meniscus repair. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Nagaraj, Dr. Billy, and uh, Avana Atrix for giving me this opportunity to talk. So my topic is basically next generation all inside all suture meniscus repair. So I'll be showing a case. So it's a 21 years old boy who's basically a football player from Nagaland. So he had history to his right knee while playing. His foot was stuck and was hit by the next person. So he came with main complaints of pain while weight bearing and he was not able to bend much and also he had instability. On clinical examination, he had a lateral joint line tenderness, McMurray was positive, Lachman was positive and also his range of movement was up to 90 to 100 degrees was okay. After that, he had painful movement. So looking at his MRA, it was more like a ghost science. We're looking at a more of a vertical tear. So basically, it was a complex tear, as the MRA reported. So we were looking more of a complex vertical or a complex radial tear. So I'll just go to the uh, intro of video. So what we look is the lateral meniscus. So basically, it's a complex tear. I would say that it's a radial tear, which is complex. So first, uh, I'm clearing the soft tissues to have a better view. Freshening up the white, white edges. So as you see, it is a, actually a proper complete radial tear and also it's got a horizontal or a longitudinal component more towards the white, white zone or the white, red zone. And also, as you see, there's a lot of uh, red areas. It's a fresh injury. He had come to me within five days of injury. This is somewhat a little bit similar to what Dr. Ashok had showed because... Uh, it is a radial tear and also here also showed few videos about uh, all inside my topic. So something similar. So I had to remove the unstable uh, part of the meniscus. The remaining part of the meniscus had a pretty decent tissue. The tissue quality was good. In my upcoming slides, I'll explain about uh, my angle of penetration, depth of penetration also. It varies depending upon the case. So I'm using here a all inside a all suture, the recent one, fiber stitch.
As we pass through, we'll have a rough idea about the quality of the meniscus and how good your bite is. You can see the popliteal tendon behind. More of anterior part or the white white zone of the area of the meniscus was affected. It had a pretty good tissue in the posterior part or the outer aspect. So I shuttle it. The first stitch is going to fall now. And that's the second one. So basically, if you look at the literature support, as Dr. Ashok had already explained, generally radial tear is a little bit complex. And when you have an additional complex radial tear, the literature is very minimal on repair. So this was a nice article by uh, J. Shu Liu. It's a case report. But this was more of a horizontal stitch and uh, he had done it with an ethylon. So all inside, all suture. So this is something which is relatively recent. So this is a study which was published last year in Custa by Timothy. So they looked at three different types of things. One is an inside out. The other one is a horizontal mattresses, or like how Jai Chulu explained. The other one is a proper all inside. So all inside, all suture specifically, they felt they had better biomechanical behaviors and also less displacement and high maximal load. Now coming about the penetration, it is very important that just one point in favor of all inside when compared to an inside out. Even though the penetration, you can be very careful. When you tie the knots, you have a high chance of obliterating the lateral geniculate artery when you tie the knots on the from outside. Otherwise, generally, inside out and all, all inside both have good, pretty decent results on a long term. And coming to the angle. So as you see in this picture, you can see the popliteus tendon. Behind the popliteus tendon, you can see the peroneal nerve, and you can also see the popliteal artery. So my tear was almost somewhere here. So generally, accessing the uh, body a little bit posterior part of the body. Antimedial portal is very good. But of course, if you have to go to the posterior horn, you need to go through the antilateral portal. So as Dr. Nagaraj had already discussed, when you flex the knee to 90 degree, it actually pushes the vessels and the nerves behind. But the injury to the vessels and nerves are much higher when the knee is somewhere between 0 to 45 degree of flexion. So you should be careful about the angle of the knee flexion. The next thing is that when you use an all inside all suture or all inside technique, you need to know the depth of penetration. That was again a question which was asked by Dr. Nagaraj to Dr. Ashok. So basically, this is an article, a nice article, which explains how much should be the depth of penetration. If you look at the A, B, and C, basically they're dividing the meniscus into anterior half and posterior half. The posterior half is further divided as the posterior horn, middle part, junctional, and C is the posterior part of the body. So the depth of penetration basically has got few things which we have to understand. One thing is that you have to penetrate the capsule. So normally the capsule thickness is around 6 to 8 mm. So you need more penetration because you have to go behind that. So this X2 is basically the distance which has to travel more. That is usually extra 2 to 4 mm. So what the article says is that your X2 is not just enough. In addition to that, you determine how much you have to keep depending on where you're going to take the bite. So roughly you get this. If you're going to take the Y position, it's roughly around 2 mm in addition to the already. So if you look at the conclusion, so basically X1 is the normal capsular thickness, which is around 6 to 9 mm. And X2 is the additional to 1.5 to mm, which you need to go. So totally you need around 8 to 10 mm to penetrate the capsule itself. That is the first point. In addition to that, you also need extra 2 to 4 mm on maximum 6 to 8 mm, depending on where you're going to take the bite on the meniscus. So usually it can be as short as 8 mm and usually it is not more than 16 mm. 
So roughly you will be around 10 to 14. Most of the people keep a standard 12 to 14. And coming to the post of rehab, uh, what I follow is that the first two weeks I have a knee ROM around 30 degree and I keep them strict non-weight bearing. And two to four weeks, I start the partial weight bearing. Of course, most of the people keep the non-weight bearing up to six weeks, but there's no clear consensus on that. So we follow different protocols. So my protocol is based on what I have learned from my teachers and where different places I have traveled. So combining all those knowledge is what I have derived. And it's also very similar to what was published by Linda. So two to four weeks, I have an ERM of around 60 degree. They start the partial weight bearing or a total weight bearing. And four to six weeks, I start the full weight bearing actually. And the knee ROM, I slowly increase it to 90 and then increase it further. I always give a ROM brace. So is that a universal rehab protocol? That's something which has been very common question. So this is a nice study, a systematic review study published in AJSM in 2016 by Kevin. So he looked at 15 articles, 15 studies, basically out of which two was level one, around four were level three and all remaining were level four evidence studies. So these two studies, they focused only on knee ROM, but they allowed full weight bearing from day one. And these four studies, they focus only on weight bearing, but they allowed almost 90 degree ROM from day one. And there were a few studies which focused on both. They had a particular ROM as well as a particular weight bearing. So what I do is something similar to Lind et al. It's a level one evidence study. So something like first two weeks I had around 30, then three to four weeks around 60. And five to six, six weeks is around 90 degree. And patients usually get back to sporting activities as early as possible. So by around three months, they start to run away. Six months, they get back to their activity levels. So the conclusion of that study was that significant variation exists between post-operative protocols and there's no clear consensus on the current protocol. So this is a patient. Uh, I operated him last year. It's now a one year. So he's back to his full sporting activity and he's completely normal. He's playing his level one division games. So coming to the conclusion, all inside technique has a little bit lesser risk of vascular injury. Of course, there can be vascular injury, but you have to be very clear. And all inside all suture is something which is new and it's starting to show a lot of promising results. The knee flexion angle, the angle of penetration and the depth of penetration are key factors to avoid any iatrogenic injuries. And I thank all my teachers. Thank you, Dr. Rufus. It was a wonderful presentation. We have uh, adequate time now uh, for the discussion uh, on all the topics. So I'll initiate the discussion with the Dr. Rufus itself. Uh, so you shared uh, your tips and tricks very well on your uh, all inside technique and you showed a radial tear uh, as one of the examples. Uh, would, you, would you like to share uh, the situation where the issue quality is very poor and you are worried that your all-inside devices are going to cut through. So how do you salvage that situation? In such situations, I will use a scorpion. I would try to take the more of all-inside completely from inside, like a horizontal mattress. I've done for a few cases also. Like uh, this case also, I was very skeptical. I was just wondering whether I should take an extra bite. But I found that a little bit stable, so I just left it off because usually I have a feeling of when I go through the meniscus tissue, I just feel whether it's okay or sometimes you, as you start doing, you will know that, uh, of course, all of us here know. So we know that it's very difficult. Sometimes it is a uh, very bad tissue that the quality is not good. So extra stitches, even Dr. Ashok showed a few crisscross stitches and other things also. It's been well, well described in the literature. So I would take horizontal stitches in addition to that, like how Jay Chulu showed, showed I'll take both the sides, a little bit more anterior, a little bit more posterior, and then uh, do an addition for that, in addition to all inside. Yes, Vikram. Yeah. yeah, I just have another comment to make. These radial tears, when you're debriding them, as you debride them and you take away tissue, and you try to reapproximate the two ends together, you're actually over-constraining it. And over a period of time, when you, when you have range of motion and weight bearing, they're almost like root tests. They'll actually move apart over a period of time. And a lot of all-inside devices, I think, should be used along with, you know, the scorpion, where you can actually see the knot tying. You know, you don't over-constrain the apposition between oh. the two ends of the meniscus because it may look good at time zero, but at time, you know, whatever, in the future, there's a chance that it, that it, that it actually gives way. That's why the bony tunnel techniques, like treating them like root tests that Laprad has, uh, has described, are, are, you know, are getting more and more popular these days. 
I completely to accept. Summarize, yeah, to summarize the discussion on radial tears on the lateral side, uh, all of us have seen. in uh, two types of tears one which are posterior to the popliteus and one which are at the level of the popliteus and anterior so the ones which are posterior to the popliteus are very amenable to healing so your rasping and your side to side stitches all inside stitches etc will make sure that the healing is very good the challenge is in the tears which are near the popliteus and which are in the anterior part especially the ones which dr ashok showed where the tear is extending all the way to the white zone of all the way to the capsule So it's like a truncated, transected meniscus. The two parts. So that tear is totally different from the tear which are radial tears in posterior to the popliteus. So a repair technique which is inside out, like Dr. Ashok showed, the rebar technique which the Mayo Clinic has showed, which is two longitudinal uh, stitches and two horizontal stitches. The rebar technique or the hashtag technique is uh, one of the things which you can do on the lateral side. Uh, uh, transosseous pullouts with your technique works well on the medial side. On the lateral side, it's going to be technically difficult, but that is another option which you can have. And obviously, for these tears, which are anterior to the popliteus, you need to have the fibrin clot in place because routine bio, uh, the ABC which Sagar showed. It is not just the anatomic reduction, but also the biology and the uh, compression that is uh, needed to be uh, ensuring the healing. So I think uh, uh, radial tears. Anything else, uh, Billy? yeah i i'm i'm just going to add that question on to vikram so so you have a radial root tear of the posterior medial meniscus so if you got a zone uh, type 2b or type 2c uh, as described by laprad and you find that the tissue closer to the root is um, not a not a good quality and so you're going to debride all of that off so what you've got is a deficient meniscus of about say 6 to 9 mm so when you make a tunnel laprad says make an anatomical tunnel but if you actually pull your remnant meniscus into the anatomical place you probably are pulling the meniscus into the joint so what is your take on that what will you do yeah so i would start with saying that the anatomy of the root is a very debatable topic because these days even the shiny white fibers have been considered as part of the attachment of the root posteriorly we don't take them into consideration when we say 9.6 mm behind the medial tibial eminence or whatever we do so this is very debatable number one number two very pertinent question that if the quality of the medial most tissue that's the actual root where it's going in is terrible do you actually shift your tunnel more medially and do it well that would be the most available option when you don't have any choice there because you're going to over constrain your repair if you try to bring it anatomically but there has been a study on this that if you move it even 2 to 3 mm away from the root it increases the contact pressures by about 75% so do we leave it then no we would do it i would do it i would still go non anatomic because anatom anatomy is debatable because that's the best option we have okay can i add a comment yes yes doctor yeah. uh, fingers up uh, most of this uh, radial tears uh, the tissue quality or uh, is not good so uh, when you have to put multiple inside out stitches where you put a vertical stitch which acts as a rip stop stitch then you compress it so you put more stitches there is always a possibility of the meniscus getting cut through so once you cut uh, meniscus cut through then you are screwed you are, uh, it ends up with a meniscectomy so we have to find the right balance we can say we can show one nice case where you done properly and so and we can say few stitches uh, say oh uh, yes we will put only few stitches but the thing is we have to balance it out okay? that's the thing so in radial tear and also in all meniscal tear minimal repair is the best so you get adequate reduction get minimal putting eight stitches 10 stitches you are putting you are damaging ultimately uh, a vascular tissue that's my take so you are putting a, a, a 10 stitches Twelve stitches. If you are getting good stable repair with even four stitches, I will say that is fair enough. If it doesn't heal with four or five stitches with uh, adequate rehab, non weight bearing for six weeks, then how many stitches you put is not going to heal. It's just for you to feel better on day one, day zero of the surgery. Maybe I'm controversial about it, but that's my opinion. Sorry. Yes, Vikram. Yeah, Ashok. 
so coming yes. to that let's go yeah. back to our basics of relative stability and absolute stability yeah. so when you repair a meniscus my question to you is do you want absolute stability or do you want relative stability uh, thing is uh, i'll come to that it's not about not about relative stability or absolute stability if we have to get absolute stability at day 0 but to achieve that relative stability like in any fracture you want to put a screw and you tighten it tighten it tighten it and it should end up with comminution so when the fracture ends up with comminution then the he- it overall affects the healing potential so in fracture you can bone graft and get away but in a meniscus if it cuts through what options do you have you end up doing a meniscectomy for the patient so you should always balance that so we see in all these orthoscopic techniques where they put a, uh, for a radial tear two rip stop stitches on either side and two stitches on either side so so putting so many stitches there you're tying up all those things it may cut through my thing is i am not against that i am not against my thing is you have to balance you have to get the right balance there so that you should not be less you should not be more you should get the right balance where you get good approximation the fixation should be stable at day one and the, the key thing there is the biology you have the biology should if the meniscus doesn't have any biology how much of stitches you put is not going to heal the end of the day the meniscus has to heal and you have to give a stable fixation that's comes so putting so many stitches getting a tight uh, uh, reduction and if the biology is not there whatever stitch you put eventually it's going because the uh, forces which go through the knee are so much how much of stitches with uh, uh, number 2 5 over stitches is not going to hold it there. so that's my thinking so we should not do harm that's my basic thing so we should allow the biology to heal if you feel at day one you have to put 10 stitches for it to hold and it for it to heal and it has failed already uh, another question to ashok in, uh, yeah ashok go ahead, go ahead, com- complete radial tear yeah you got a white white red white and the red red zone involved yes do you believe that if you just repair it the the the, the white white zone does heal uh the thing is the white white zone will not heal uh the thing is uh, in the studies which i went through for this uh, preparation uh, initially when the uh, studies in the 2005 to 2010 they advised us to take out the white white zone but the studies which were, were the, in the systematic review all the studies where they have done in the korean studies where these people are very clever they put med- metal implants all these korean surgeons put metal implants and make sure the patient comes back in a year's time for implant exit and they do relook for all the surgery they do so they went went back in where they not taken out the uh, white white zone but they found that there is some fibrous healing between the white white zone so even if there is a tear in the white white zone if it is not healed or if it is tear it doesn't out- affect their functional outcome so Uh, now they have moved out that no need to repair the white white zone we can leave but the key thing is the red red zone and the red white zone should be stable that is very important tension free stable repair uh, there is a question for all uh, uh, one of the audience have mentioned that most of the cases shown are fresh cases what will be the line of treatment in a chronic meniscal tear say it's a six month down the line what are your indications for repair nagraj do you want to take that yes uh, i i'll go ahead so yes the timing uh, was an issue in the past where we graded these tears as acute subacute and chronic and obviously acute and subacute tears which was about up to 3 to 6 months we were we were we felt it is amenable to repair but there are tear variants which are beyond 6 months like a ramp lesion so if you have a ramp lesion even at 7 months 8 months or 9 months it's an essential lesion it has to be repaired uh, as far as the bucket handle tears are concerned uh you need to rely on the zone of the tear even if it's chronic if it's a red zone tear with with the modern techniques of repair where a b c is maintained uh that is you create an anatomic reduction you create a biology to heal especially in the presence of an acl tear uh and if you can create a strong construct even at 7 months 8 months etc even in the chronic uh, tear you can take your chances but if it's in the red white zone if it's a chronic tear Uh, if it's a bucket handle tear which doesn't remain reduced it remains subluxed all these are pointing to the uh, fact that this is not a tear that's going to heal and then those would be the ones which are for meniscectomy the radial tears i would just like to add one point again it's uh, uh, amenable to a total meniscectomy if you do a meniscectomy for these uh, if you have a choice between 
repairing versus a meniscectomy obviously we are going to go for the repair my suggestion in, and my tip is that you should never ever use your uh, shaver or your punch to remove the white zone or the, any of the tissue first finish off your repair first do your rasping do your bur burring finish off your repair first and then you can do your micro cleaning especially with small joint shaver blade so this is this is a tissue which is very uh, poor quality as has been discussed and these are the tips to make sure that it heals can i add some uh, yes sir yes sir so there has been a wonderful paper by professor laprad on the scene that uh, regarding the chronicity of the tear the three factors which actually contribute more uh, with the functional outcomes is the age of the patient uh, the international cartilage research society grading more than three and uh, kernel mal alignment so if you have tackled these three issues the age is out of your control but other two issues if you can control it it actually does uh, have similar results than compared to the acute uh, repairs can i add one thing yes vikram yeah. so i think there are tears that are waiting to heal for me there are two types of tears tears waiting to heal tears where biomechanics are against healing so bucket handle tear rash tears peripheral tears these tears are waiting to heal so whatever you do for me time period really doesn't matter my intention is to repair them as much as possible root tears radial tears especially on the medial side depending on as sagar said biomechanics of the patient alignment of the patient so we have a radial tear in a varus knee on the medial side root tear on the medial side varus knee it's not going to heal whatever you do unless you correct it so be very circumspect about radial tears and their variants like root tears you have to do a lot more many times than just repairing the meniscus it's just the tip of the iceberg rightly said uh, vikram um i got a question for nagraj regarding your centralization uh you use a knot technique where you put an anchor and then put a knot on top uh um what about transosseous technique where you pull the meniscus down onto the tibia what is your experience on that so i have uh, presented a uh, not a not a root tear with centralization but i am uh, fairly uh, proficient with doing the pull out suture technique and the mid body of the meniscus and uh, this was for a radial tear through and through radial tear to the mid body in a young patient with normal alignment with normal cartilage and it was a poor quality tissue so we did everything that we discussed here today so i did the side to side stitches the hashtag repair on top hashtag repair below i took the transosseous sutures to two tunnels uh, the two tunnel laprat technique and i have a follow up of this patient which is more than 2 years now with the healing of the tissue the the counter thing is that you are actually uh, uh, preventing any mobility of the meniscus there is a study i think it's a german study which uh, which has done the normal mobility of the medial meniscus and they have found that compared to the normal mobility the transosseous suture fixed medial meniscus there is not much of difference so the lateral meniscus is known to be mobile the medial meniscus by itself is not a very mobile structure and with my own uh, results i know that it, the outcomes are quite good even if you land up doing a pull out suture technique thanks nagraj vikram i got a question for you uh, you may yep. we spoke a lot about the medial uh, posterior root tear of the medial meniscus what about the posterior root tear of the lateral meniscus which you may rarely encounter when you do an acl reconstruction in that case do you put a separate transosseal tunnel or you pull it out through your acl tunnel itself yeah so lateral root tears are a completely different category of tears as compared to medial root tears because they basically have a contribution towards stability of the knee so a lot of the pitch shift and what you get is a contribution of your lateral root tear the attachment is a lot more anterior than the medial root tear very close to the acl attachment so many times you tend to use the acl tunnel for me it's always two independent tunnels because though anatomy is debatable but you try to get as close as possible to it though there may be a confluence but by varying the degrees in which you you hold your jig you can actually make two independent tunnels and do them independently all right thanks so just a small tip there uh, when you are doing your lateral meniscus root tunnel it uh, has to be more vertical and lower than your acl tunnel and it can be made more not just in the medial lateral plane not just in the superior inferior plane but also in the medial lateral plane you can make sure they don't confluence by making it more vertical and more oblique 
uh, one point one point which i think we should cover for the benefit of the audience and uh, uh, this is open to the house uh, when there is an acl with any of the tear pattern that we have discussed whether it's a ramp lesion or a bucket and meniscus tear or a radial tear uh what would be the sequence what would be your steps what would you do first meaning whether you do your repair first whether you do your tunnels how do you go about it so we'll start with the uh, sagar yes sir so for the route at least uh, i would go ahead and uh, pass my uh, sutures through the tunnel so i drill the tunnel first get a loop from the tunnel back uh, very often i have found that uh, if i take in bites from the meniscus and then i'm drilling even with a protect uh, protective uh, uh position of the knee i still have entangled my sutures which i have already been taken uh, through the meniscus so i prefer to do the tunneling first so that i get good accurate tunnel position and which is anatomical or knee anatomical at least and then proceed with the uh, meniscal repairing so you do both the femur and the tibial tunnel first and then you go for the meniscus repair so let's ask uh, dr ashok Uh, Rufus, Doctor Rufus, you can come in. Yeah, yeah, I normally repair the meniscus first, so I prepare the tunnels for the ACL. I keep everything open up. So it's always much easier to repair the meniscus before the ACL reconstruction because once you reconstruct the ACL, then it becomes an issue. The other things which commonly we face is that uh, the cycling and all those things. You are a little bit skeptical once you repair the meniscus, so your aggressive cycling of the graft and all those things will be avoided or kept minimal. I do a very gradual, tension-free cycling. but always meniscus repair first before going for the acl reconstruction graft passing okay quickly uh, uh, dr ashok yeah uh, well, i think... usually do the meniscal repair pass the sutures and don't tie them inside of sutures pass them then do finish the acl reconstruction completely then go ahead and uh, tie the sutures great uh, dr vikram so i do my meniscus repair completely if it's an all inside then there's no problem if i use an inside out or an outside in i put all my sutures in finish my meniscus job but i don't tie my sutures i finish my acl and then tie them in the end okay uh, and billy, definitely put my scope in after that to see whether they're tight enough okay uh, billy your I, i i do exactly the same so repair the meniscus first unless of course it's an inside out where you park the sutures and then scope and uh, tie it yeah great i think it's a very valid we realize that each one of us has their own uh, own ways to go about it and all of us are wor- worried that the sutures are going to give way once we cycle the knee once we are going through our acl reconstruction so my my uh, tips are and somewhere in the middle so i do my acl tunnel femoral first i then do the meniscus repair now if it's an inside out suture or otherwise i make sure that it's a very stable repair so i know my knee is stable between 0 to 90 degree so when my tibial tunnel is being made i know my knee is absolutely stable between 0 to 90 degree and my acl graft is passed if it's an inside out repair all of us would agree if you space it 3 to 4 mm apart if you have done a proper uh, sequential tightening they don't give way and if they do at that point of time you can always go ahead and repair it so the problem is in hyperflexion so when you go for hyperflexion of the femoral tunnel and if you have done your repair it is likely to stretch out so the take home message is preferably try to do your femoral tunnel first so your hyperflexion maneuver is gone and then you can do any combination of techniques to do the repair so that was a important topic we covered and there's a uh, question in the chat for dr sagar how do you make sure that your inside out technique is a controlled technique and that your exit of the needle is not a, like a blind shot it doesn't hit the neurovascular structure so this is a point which we were discussing could you shed more light on it Yes, sir. So as uh, already we had discussed that try and avoid uh, taking incisions five millimeter or more than that posterior to the adductor tubercle on the femoral side, because then definitely you are going to endanger the saphenous nerve. Also, it is worthwhile to uh, do a proper transillumination. You can see the light, switch off the OT lights, uh, see the transillumination, so you are not hitting the veins and superficial nerves as well. if you have taken proper incision and if you have inserted a proper retractor or spoon there i don't think it's a blind technique because whenever you are retrieving the needles you hyperflex the knee to 70 80 degrees it actually uh, helps you prevent any neurovascular injury so just a few tips here because i myself was with <clears throat> dr lagard and uh, there are quite a few nice tips that he follows obviously for the posterior horn is where and the posterior uh, horn and the root area is where you are really worried about uh, the blind passage so for that 
the viewing is always from the anteromedial portal the needles are coming from the diagonally opposite portal so you try to sky off from the midline always and you make sure that when you are penetrating the capsule your assistant drops it into flexion so when he drops it into flexion the needle deflect on the spoon and they uh, they come um, uh, towards your wound when you are retrieving your uh, sutures you can use a curved needle holder from the gynex set from the obgy department so that that curve helps you to pass it deep and retrieve the deeper needles so flexion of the knee this curved needle and coming from the diagonally opposite portal trying to come from a higher angle so you can actually sometimes create an accessory anterolateral portal and make sure that you are coming from a higher angle all this will make sure that you are deflecting away from the midline so are there any burning questions on yes sir i have yes sir yes sir so this is regarding a few of the biomechanical studies uh, which have been done on the material of the uh, sutures which we use for the meniscal repair so we have several studies uh, all of them are cadaveric studies and they say that if you have uh, something added to the ultra high molecular weight uh, polyethylene such as like arthrex so they have uh, polyesters the the mitec ones have uh, pds while smith nephew ones ultra bread had only ultra high molecular, uh, molecular weight polyethylene so they do have differences in the pull out strength and uh, their tensile strength uh, in the clinical practice because we all have been using all the different types of suture materials and suturing devices have you ever noticed that this actually clinically reflects that uh, only polyesters or ultra high molecular weight polyethylene and a mixture of the devices and you have higher pull out strength or meniscus getting cut clinically because all of these studies have been uh, biomechanical biomechanical studies in the labs we don't know how it works clinically so a great question uh, sagar and i would share my experience uh we are always looking for the holy grail so we want a suture that is strong enough to <clears throat> hold the repair between the race of healing and uh, the uh, repair strength uh, the repair strength is maintained until healing happens but we don't want something that is going to be too strong so the present sutures whether uh, they are fiber wires or uh, other otherwise they are i think stable enough they are once uh, uh, when you are handling them you realize that they are not especially the 2o 2o uh, configuration the 2o and the o configuration are are extremely uh, soft to the tissue and i have had the opportunity of doing uh, staged procedures where we have the opportunity of looking at these repairs in the second second uh, reluxcopy and you see a nice synovialization over these sutures so the fear that these strong sutures are going to cut through or abrade the cartilage is less when you are doing a horizontal cleavage type of repair where you are using these knotted techniques it's very important that the knot gets buried so you can use your uh, knot pusher on the lower suture so that the knots don't come up so all these tips can make sure that there is minimal abrasion of your cartilage the present sutures are seem to me seeming to me the 2o configuration seeming to me is the right combination of strong repair but safe to the tissue great thank you i think there was a question about prp uh, with respect to the biology uh, all of us would agree that whenever uh, healing is a challenge we look at the fibrin clot i do not have much of an experience with the platelet rich plasma because it is basically injected into the knee we don't necessarily put it inside our repair so i have no great uh, experience with it if anybody uh, has they could please share i don't have any experience on that So, so I also don't have any experience. Uh, I mentioned based on the literature. Literature, there are studies which they have uh, injected PRP after. Correct. So all of us would agree that whenever we are doing an ACL reconstruction simultaneously, we are quite confident that the elements are there for those isolated radial tears. Yes, you need to look at fibrin clot as a technique. Fibrin clot uh, technique is challenging to deliver the clot into the wound. You need to have some special cannula. and you need to nicely wash out the fibrin clot to make sure that there are no rbcs left in it which create a bloody field and you need to make some nice pieces of the fibrin clot so that it is nicely sandwiched between your repair where inside out sutures as dr ashok showed have to be passed but not tied so you can put your fibrin clot between the two sutures and then once it is sandwiched you can ask your assistant to start tying it so it gets uh, compressed in the repair so all this will make sure that your healing is good so billy any burning questions i think we have covered i think we have all the topics yeah i think we have covered uh, most of the aspects of it i think um, that's about it 
so i think uh, we had a great discussion uh, a wonderful faculty a great uh, uh, sunday evening spent very well i hope uh, the audience also got a lot of take home messages and uh, with this and thanking all the faculty i'd like to end the meeting we can ask the ortho tv members yes. to stop the live stream